Amen. Good morning. All right. Number of announcements. If you're a first time visitor here, we do have a visitor's card on our bulletin. Appreciate it if you would uh, fill that out and take it off and put it on the back table as you go out or give it to one of the ushers and want to welcome you and want to welcome those who are listening online. Uh, once again, the uh, end of the uh, year envelopes are on the back table for you. Uh, also, I want to note that uh, you can always go on uh, YouTube and see any past messages or anything, so they're there. Not necessarily in chronological order. I'm not quite sure what that is, but, uh, but, but they're there somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, if you're interested in going on in the readathon uh, this year, uh, Capital Readathon, sign up in, uh, in the foyer, so that would be great. And uh, did we pick a date? Yeah, there, there's several come up to me, so I think we can, we can, uh, yeah, well that, usually we try that Tuesday afternoon, it'll be, be fine. So, uh, let's see what's available. Uh, the board meeting, uh, that was scheduled on the 15th, will be changed to the 22nd, uh, on the 16th, I have uh, the wing conference over here on base, and uh, nothing can start without me because everything opens up with the chaplain's invocation. See, then I don't do anything. To, well, actually, I got a couple classes I'm teaching, but I mean, <laughs> but uh, matter of fact, they always announce me at the banquet in the evening, saying we can't eat till the chaplain prays. So, so I mean, I guess people would starve if I wasn't up there praying. So. <laughs> that, that, I tell you, yeah, it's funny when I when I go to the uh, wing meeting and say uh, say now now chaplain you make sure we have good weather for this mission <laughs> like I got that kind of power I mean <laughs> so anyway it's kind of funny yeah right <laughs> today's communion and prepare your hearts for that and praise the Lord that we have that. Uh, insert the bulletin glimpses, and they always have some interesting things uh, on there, so take note of that as well. Uh, our missions update have a couple interesting updates for you. Uh, oh, before we do the update, I want to read this card to you. This is from Tony Hoy. Of course, Doug passed recently, Doug Hoy. Uh, and it says, Camp Strings Community Church. Your kindness and concern will always be remembered with deepest gratitude by the family of Doug Hoy. Thank you for uh, the donation of seven Gideon Bibles in honor of uh, Doug's home going uh, to heaven. Uh, I covet your prayers for me and our family as we uh, walk through this difficult valley of grief. Blessings, Tony Hoy. And uh, it's kind of interesting. God has given him grace. Of course, he was in the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry. He was in the FBI as an agent before that. And uh, he also was um, a man who had special grace because he, he was playing tennis one time but over 20 years ago. His heart valve blew out and he survived it. Most people don't. Several operations, so he gets to be 82 years old. The Lord just gave, gave special grace. I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. So just remember Tony and, and of course, uh, Cheryl and Steve, you know, as they go through this. Uh, update from the Philippines, uh, June and Vanjie Magaya. In 2009, a friend brought a, a girl named Jelly, which is kind of interesting. Uh, to church. Uh, she immediately fell in love with the church and received Christ as her Savior. Shortly after this time, a tumor developed behind her right eye. As a result, she lost her eyesight in that eye. But she went through bouts of depression, but realized that Christ's suffering was much more than hers. Isn't that tremendous? 
She is now a public school teacher, and at last year's class Christmas party, she shared the gospel with her class, and every student raised her hand to receive Christ, along with many of the parents. Isn't that great? It's tremendous. Over the years, June has been sharing the gospel with his family, and especially during family reunions. Some of them have not liked it, but at least 15 family members have responded to the gospel appeal over the years and received Christ. Daniel and Miriam Liebrich in Belgium. Now Daniel tells the story of an elderly woman who used to attend church faithfully for years. But in recent years, her family has forbidden her from going to church services. However, every Christmas, she would send the Liebrichs a Christmas card with a short note. However, this year, after a 20-year connection with the church, she sent a letter to them relating several examples of her witness and experience with her family and neighbors. And Daniel, and including some pretty good exegesis of the scriptures and some pretty good apologetics, Daniel had no idea she was such an evangelist for Christ. Uh, Anna was born to Tim and Divine. Tim, of course, their son. Uh, Liebrich, on the 31st of December, 2023, the baby and mommy don't find. Soon after Miriam's dad, Victor, passed away recently, on Christmas Day, actually, his brother did as well followed by a church member. And another church member is in the hospital on death's door. There's much sadness, you know, within the congregation, but the hope of the Lord is strong as well. So there's your missions update uh, for this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. You would uh, turn with me. We're in Romans, Romans chapter five. Should be should be what's in the bulletin. We're going to be reading verses one through five. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, again for this day. We thank you for uh, giving us the freedom uh, to meet here as a group and to encourage and to, to trust you and worship you and learn and grow in you. We thank you that uh, you give us trials we thank you that uh, you allow us to not be caught in the depths of our sin. And we know uh, everyone knows people that are caught in different things, and we pray for them as well. And we thank you that um, you continue to help us here, that you continue to, to allow us to persevere into you, and that you'd give us a character that uh, people would see Christ in us and not ourselves. Thank you for uh, everything that you've done. We ask that you'd be with here, be with us as we continue to sing praises to you and honor you in that, and that you'd help Pastor Lowther in the message as well as in communion here. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews had spent nine chapters on evidence that Jesus Christ not only is our Savior, but it's all you need. Because the Jewish believers were still trying to hold on to the Old Testament law. In the 10th chapter, he gives them a, a, a challenge that if you are in Christ, that you have a certain characteristics, uh, including gathering together with believers and admonishing one another. Uh, and he gives them a pretty strong admonition. Um, and, and, but then at the end of this 10th chapter, before he gets into the examples of the Hall of Faith in the 11th chapter, he tries to give them some encouragement. Um, you know, uh, 
he doesn't want to leave it where they're kind of beaten down and kind of everything else. He says, says now, 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 now listen, I, I have confidence in you. By, by the way, this technique Paul used several times in his epistles. He says, I, I'm confident that you know the Lord and are serving the Lord and you're doing these things. And, you know, I'm just trying to challenge you to grow in your life. One of the things that is very pivotal in the Christian life is if we say that we believe in the Lord, our lives should show it. Saying that we follow Christ must follow, be followed by actually doing it. <laughs> if we're in Christ, we should live for Christ. And so that's the challenge he gives us here. As we pick it up on the 32nd verse of chapter 10, it says, But I recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you entered a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and a, an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and... He who is coming will uh, come and not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, but we are not all of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. And so after issuing warnings to the readers, Hebrews gives them a little bit of encouragement. By the way, we learned something about the author here, don't we? Is the fact that he was a prisoner. He says, you had comfort in my chains. You weren't ashamed of my chains. Some say that points to a high probability that this is Paul who wrote it. But there was a lot of Christians who were <laughs> put in prison at that time. And so, but this, it does, this does match up with, of course, Paul's experience. And so, this is a launching pad into the 11th and 12th chapters where he's going to go through the hall of faith and you, you know we have uh, a large cloud of witnesses and so on like that so that uh, he's going to go that these are examples we can follow. Now the writer expresses his confidence and says you know I've, I've said all these things but I'm very confident that you are true believers. He says I'm confident I, I, I've seen evidence of that and and as he begins to list the evidence that he's seen that they, they really were followers of Christ, and not only that they really were followers of Christ, but that they'll continue to uh, be faithful to the Lord. And so Hebrews is confident, I'm confident that you are, are real believers. I mean, remember Paul at the end of 2 Corinthians wasn't so sure. He says, you do know Jesus, don't you? You know, in other words, uh, boy, I want to see some evidence. But this, in this letter, he says, I see evidence uh, that they really held to a true faith. And they said, when you first believed, you were under severe persecution and you, you did not cave. You did not renounce your faith. You held forth. So you were under persecution and I saw you stand for Jesus Christ in persecution. So when their faith was tested, they held firm. He says, I, I, I see that evidence. And not only that, you identified with those who were persecuted. So in other words, when there were others persecuted, you didn't hide, say, well, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know him. You know, you had Peter, right? Uh, I, I don't know the man. Um, Paul had that experience, remember, and in 2 Timothy 4, he says, you know, when I stood before Caesar, no one stood with me. He said, you know, may the Lord forgive them for this. In other words, he expected 
Those people had been with him all along. Uh, when he stood to give his testimony for Caesar, that they would be there witnessing for him. He looked around and there was no one. And so so these, these Christians didn't do that. They identified with those people who were persecuted. And, and so he said, I see that. I see that evidence. I see that you suffered for your faith. And you did not shrink back from your faith. And so you're going, and he says, I see that you've made, been made a spectacle before the world. This is a very interesting Greek word. It's the word we get our English word theater from. Uh, when you have someone up on a the stage, they're making a spectacle of themselves. Because what they're doing is not real. It's a depiction. It's a story. It's a thing there to view. Uh, and of course, we also get our word in the English spectacle from it, you know, that it, <coughs> things like that. But it's the word theater that we get in English. You're put on display in the world. You, you stand out like a sore thumb to the world, right? You, uh, when a Christian goes into a place where they're having a party, he sort of stands out like a sort of, he sort of cramps her style. <laughs> uh, I remember years ago, I was teaching a Christian school and I worked part time at a shoe store. It actually, uh, you know, it actually was Montgomery Ward. Anyone remember Montgomery Ward? And it became Wards and everything else. The young people, that's, that's history. It just, uh, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> And I heard, overheard the manager of the shoe department said, oh, be, careful, be careful around Lowther, he's a preacher. <laughs> it's like, you know, I cramped your style, you know. Be, be careful uh, what you say about Lowther, he's a preacher. And so, uh, you know, we cramped your style. We made a spectacle before the world. It's also used of gladiators in, in the gladiator ring. They were made a spectacle, you know, in, in the world. And so... Uh, it was used of a Roman conquering general who they were doing what's called a triumph, which where, where he marches the uh, people he'd conquered in, in chains behind his chariot to make a display of them, make a spectacle of them. And they'd build this arch of triumph that the general would march underneath of there and, and then behind those who conquered all the all the booty, all the, all the uh, riches that he had conquered and, and things like that were brought back and put on display in a spectrum. But it's also used in Colossians 2.15 that Jesus is going to make a spectacle of his enemies. <laughs> and so all those uh, demons and all those who opposed him, he's going to march them as a spectacle before the Father, they're on display, before judgment is pronounced. And so, uh, so that's this word theater that we get in English. As a matter of fact, Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, uh, where he tells the Corinthians, you know, you guys are honored before the Lord, but us apostles, we're made a spectacle before the world. We, you're, you know, we, we are made to put up there to the world mocks us and persecutes us and criticizes us. We're made a spectacle for the cause of Christ. So anyone that serves Christ when you're around, and you know this to be true when you're around those who are unsaved, your unsaved family members, you're kind of a spectacle. You kind of cramp their style. <laughs> and so it says you're willing to be made a spectacle in the world. And since you withstood these reproaches and these threats for Christ, that I'm confident that you're really in Christ. It's because you allowed this. And then it says here, and, 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 and I think this is sort of the cherry on top, where he says, and you joyfully allowed your possessions to be plundered. In other words, not only did they arrest you and harass you, they took away your goods. And it says, for the cause of Christ, you joyfully gave them up. And so he said, that's a very strong indication that, that you're faithful and you're followers because you were joyful. Now, I don't even know how many of us would joyfully say, wow, you're going to take, take this too. Take this. 
you know. And, uh, but uh, that's quite a testimony. You know, all the worldly goods they had, whatever it was, he said, you joyfully gave them up for the cause of Christ. Okay. He says, but let me tell you, you've done all these things, but there's a better promise. God's given you whatever you gave up, whatever you sacrificed for him, he's got better rewards for you. And so, uh, even though their earthly goods were plundered, God says, I promise you eternal possessions that are going to be far better and far greater and will never fade away and no one will ever come and take it away from you. So, but the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews warns the reader, said, now I don't want you to back away. Um, if you get weary and you give up uh, and, 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 you know, becomes too much for you and you begin to crumble underneath the ridicule and the mockery and the person, he said, I don't, don't back away. You know, you're going to reap if you don't, if you don't faint, you've got to keep moving forward. And he warns them, don't back away. He says, do not become, you know, Paul said, do not become weary in what? Well doing. Because you will reap if you don't faint. And so I want you to go forward. Now he uses two concepts here, which are very important in the Christian walk. The first one's endure. The word endure in the Greek, hypostasis, means to stand under. In other words, you know, things are coming at you, but you're going to hold your ground. You're going to hold firm. That's what it means to hold firm, to stand, literally to stand under the trials. Uh, God has great reward for those who endure these. You know, one of the promises of Jesus is a promise no one's ever taken as a life verse, is the fact in this world you'll have tribulation. <laughs> Oh, that's my favorite verse. That, well, <laughs> but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But you know, my life verse is in this world, we're going to have tribulation. <laughs> it might not be your life verse, but it's surely true, right? And so we endure, and God has great wor rewards for those who endure to the end, who stand underneath, or stand firm within this tribulation. It's a great reward. He says, don't give up right before the end, and quite often that's what happens. We, we, we get to the point where we give up right, right, right before we would experience the victory. There's going to be a lot of people who stand before the Lord. The Lord's going to show you, that, you know, you gave up right before, right before the blessing. <laughs> right before the victory. You, you know, you were right there. But you gave up. And so, uh, you and, uh, and I know this, this is hard when you're going through it, but the endurance is actually very brief compared to eternity. It, it, it's not, you say, oh, this is so hard, it's so long, and it seems like that. But you know what? In the scheme of eternity, it's pretty brief, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's really not a long time. So the first one uh, and endurance is to stand under. The second one, endurance, is the word hupomino. And the word hupomino means to remain under. Hupostasis means to stand under, and this is to remain under. In other words, don't try to get an escape. You're in the middle of, you're in the middle of a trial, and you're working through this trial, and quite often our first instinct is to run. <laughs> How can I get out of this? And that's a natural instinct, you know. He said, no, remain, remain under, persevere, choose to be faithful, choose to be a testimony, even when everything's against you, stand under this trial. So you want to see endurance, look at the book of Job. <laughs> and this guy was pounded and pounded and pounded and, and uh, you know, you know and, and he stood up underneath the trial. And refused to give up, refused to give up his faith, even when his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Even when his three buddies, with friends like that who needs enemies, <laughs> his three, I call them his three neighbors, uh, come and uh, you must have done something wrong. You must have done this and you must have done that and you must have done this. 
and he still stood firm in his faith. By the way, testing is God's way of testing, uh, proving our faith. And the writer of Hebrews says, now I, I've seen you stand in trials before. I, I've seen that you, you've been faithful in these trials and everything else. And, and I trust that you're going to remain faithful to the very end, but don't back away because it seems like, especially when you take a look at Hebrews 6, that some of them are beginning to back away. And this is also a concept in Hebrews 6 that those who backed away and leave for good, they've never really been with us to begin with, you know. And so he says, don't back away. You know, the testing of your faith is precious. And it says, and by the way, you don't know how much faith you have until it's tested, right? Until you put it under the trials. And so he said, don't, don't back away from this. And that's why, uh, Lee, I had you read out of Romans 5, testing of faith is, is, is important. It, it produces experience and uh, patience and experience. And experience gives hope and hope makes not ashamed. And, and so this is the type of testing he's talking about. And God will give us strength in this endurance. That's what the first Corinthians 10, 13 talks about, that there's no testing that we receive that's not common to man, but God will give you strength that you might be able to endure it. Matter of fact, he will limit it, says in, in, in that verse, you know, that he will give a cap on that, that you might be able to endure it and your faith might remain strong. And I want you to press on. Now he quotes out of Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4. He says, first of all, the Lord is coming quickly. Now, it doesn't seem that way to us, but when we look back on all of history from eternity, we're going to say, wow, that was short. Now, when you're going through it, it doesn't seem that way, but in Habakkuk, he says, the Lord comes quickly. Matter of fact, that's the first thing you have over in Revelation Chapter uh, one is the fact that the, Jesus says, behold, I come what? Quickly. I'm coming. And so over here in Hebrews 10, he's quoting out of Habakkuk and he's saying the same thing. Behold, I'm coming. I'm coming quickly. And so because of this, uh, he said, I want you to endure. You, you can endure, right? You can't hang in there. Uh, James chapter 4, 14 through 16, tells us that our life is but a what? Vapor. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's very quick. It's gone. I mean, if you think that uh, it's hard to endure now, can you imagine those before the flood who lived to be 900 years old? I mean, so we'd be kids, all of us, <laughs> you know, compared to, you know, that time scale, right? But he says, life is but a vapor. And so because of this vapor that, you know, we have, we're here today and, you know, gone tomorrow. And because of this vapor, you know, it's a very quick life. Uh, Romans 9, 28 tells us that the Lord's going to make a short work of the earth. Wow. Uh, now, that doesn't seem that way if you listen to the unbelievers who talks about the earth being billions of years old and millions and millions, but actually the earth is a few thousand years old and it's going to make a very short work of the earth. Good. And so uh, uh, we, we come to the point of, of understanding that we can endure. It might seem like a big push, but we can endure. And so uh, we have been given the power to endure. He said, I'll strengthen you. Matter of fact, one of the greatest promises in scriptures in, in Matthew 28, he said, lo, I will be with you. How long? Always, even unto the end of the age. The word there in the Greek is aeons, into, into the eons, I'll be there. Psalm 90 tells us, says, oh, listen, maybe, you know, teach me to number my days. 
for with the Lord one day is as a what? A thousand years and a thousand years is one day. It's a very, it's very, very quick, you know. You know, might not seem so to us, but I tell you what, as you head towards the end of life, it looks like, well, wow, where did all that go? You know, you know. Um, I'm actually too young to have been married over a half a century. I really am. I, <laughs> I know my wife is, I mean. <laughs> but you know, time goes by. But it's quick. And don't back away. And then he, then he tells us, in Hebrews 10, he tells us, listen, if you back away, you're backing away from the, oh, your own rewards that the Lord has for you. He's got great rewards for you. Don't back away from that. Because he's coming. Matter of fact, what was uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2? He says the Lord's coming and he's bringing his rewards with him. <laughs> he wants to give us rewards. And so he's coming. And so, so, so don't back away from that. And then he requotes out of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, the same quote that you find over in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. We trust because we're confident that our faith in the Lord is a true faith. We're confident that the word of God is a from God, and it's true. And he said, the just shall live by faith and not by sight. And he says, if you're going to live, you're going to live by faith. Because you've got only two choices, right? You're going to live by sight or live by faith. Well, I, I, don't, I don't see. Well, I don't have to see. The Lord tells us we believe it. And we follow by faith. So the just shall live by faith. And so this is a, this is a quote from a backup. And so not only do we believe by faith, but we have to live by faith. Notice those two go together. Believing and living. If you don't live by faith, you really don't believe. You don't have a faithful belief. If you don't live by faith, there's no evidence that you actually have faith. Because, you know, what's the old saying? The proof of the pudding is what? In the eating. <laughs> well, the proof of a Christian is, do you live like one? You know, because if you don't, you're a hypocrite or a false believer. So the just shall live by faith. And so the just, the, by the way, the word just here in, in, in the Greek means righteous or spiritual, one who's rightly related, will live daily for the Lord and not hypocritical. And by the way, be, next to your salvation, your greatest thing that you possess is your testimony. It really is. And when the Lord gives you salvation, he expects you to represent him. You're an ambassador. You are an emissary. And if you don't represent the Lord right, then you're an embarrassment to the Lord. And you are counterproductive because there's a lot the world can say, hey, that guy's supposed to be a Christian, or that woman's supposed to be a Christian, but look what they're doing. You know, uh, they cheat, they lie, uh, you, know, you know, they are profane. Uh, don't tell me, you know, there's an old saying that if it doesn't work for you, don't export it. <laughs> and so uh, they have to see it works for us, right? Those who love Jesus, before we can tell them about it. Because if we have something that we want them to know and tell, and that the fact that this is works is going to make your life better, then it needs to be evidence in our own life first, right? And so, so he says, listen, the just shall live by faith, that they'll exercise a living faith with purpose and trust and conviction. And if we're always saying every time something happens, say, oh, Lord, this is terrible. Why did this happen to me and everything else? Say, 
Well, you know what? You're not exhibiting a whole lot of faith and trust. I mean, when everything was taken away from Job, including his family and everything else, is the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked came I in the world, and what? Naked shall I leave. And so, I'm not going to take any hands. How many of us, after losing all ten kids and you know all your wealth and, and, and almost all your servants, would say that? That's a lot of trust. That's a lot of faith. So Hebrews expresses a conviction that, yes, I, I believe that you indeed are true believers are enduring, but that takes two things. Conviction. Listen, conviction is very important. Because you can say all you want what you believe, but what you really believe is when you're tested and what comes out of you. That's what you really believe. You know, uh, old James Dobson's uh, quote, uh, you are what you are when your cup is bumped and what's inside spills out. You are what you are when your cup is bumped and what's inside spills out. And so the first is conviction. The second is commitment. You know, Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. No matter what. I'm going to trust him, no matter what he does to me. You know, though he slay me, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to continue to serve him and live for him. It doesn't matter. And he expresses the conviction, and the final result, he says, I, I, I believe you're going to continue faithfully. I believe you're not going to back away. But of course, the writer of Hebrews doesn't know yet, right? He's trying to encourage him to do this because they're still trying to hold on to the Old Testament law and, and things like that. He said, let go of them and embrace Christ in him alone. I'll end with this story before we come before the communion. 1952, a woman named Florence Chadwick. Florence Chadwick was going to swim between Catalina Island in the California coast. And so she gets up here, she prepares herself. It's a 26 mile swim. And in any of you ever been, you guys from California, what, it, it, it's, it's not Myrtle Beach. The water's a little bit colder. I remember when we were in LA and on Santa Monica Pier and the famous pier and all kinds of weirdos. Anyway, that's another issue. <laughs> Oh, I'm wanting to get to Las Vegas, you know. Anyway, but they have a thermometer in there. And this is in June, or the end of June. And it said 51 degrees. I said, oh, really? And that's because of the gyres in the ocean. There's, there's six gyre circles in the ocean. Fortunately, ours, our gyre comes up, comes down from Norway, comes up and picks up the warmth at the equator and comes up to our beaches. But their jar comes down from Alaska <laughs> and then picks up up to the coast of Japan. So they're getting the cold, but well, we're getting the warm. You know, and so, but she's gonna swim 26 miles in this. She jumps in, she starts her swim, there's a boat going along with her, to make sure she's all right. By the way, you know what the main purpose of people in that boat was? Chase away the sharks. And so, great whites and things like that. So they were in there to guard there. It's foggy. It's quite often it is off the coast of California. And she's heading towards uh, Palos Verde, Verde. And she finally gives up. It's foggy, gets in the boat. And when she gets in the boat, they say, the beach is a half a mile right there. She couldn't see it. She quit her swim one half mile before the finish line. She did it two years later. This time, she made it all the way. But she quit her swim one, 26 miles 
had a half a mile to go and you didn't know it. How many Christians give up when they're just about to cross the finish line? So the writer of Hebrews says, don't back away. The Lord will see you across the finish line. Paul said to the Philippians, I press on to the calling of the high mark of Jesus Christ. I press on, I press on. And so he's telling us today, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Because I'm with you. And we'll sing that song, Jesus led me all the way. Amen? Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, as we prepare to come before the communion this morning, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you draw each and every one of us close to you and that your name will be praised in and through us, Lord. And Lord, that we want to glorify your name. And Lord, if there's anyone listening online or here doesn't know Jesus, they'll come to Jesus this day. Be with us, Lord, as we come before the communion table, that we might remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ till he comes. And Lord, draw us ever closer to you and to each other and encourage everyone that's here to glorify your name through Jesus Christ. Amen. At the end, we'd like to just give a brief gospel outline. Just three basic points. And... Number one, this man over here represents all mankind because all sin and come short of glory of God. And he cannot get to heaven because evil can't dwell with God. And so his soul is destined for this lake of fire, Revelation 20. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that bridge across there is Jesus Christ. Not by works, not by anything that you do, but Jesus paid everything all for your sins on the cross that you might have eternal life. Receiving Jesus Christ by faith, that's why Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. By receiving that faith, by him by faith, you can have eternal life. If you've never done that, today would be a great day to do that because Jesus Christ is the one who paid for your sins. Amen.